coaching purists are making a mistake by never consulting. If you're really a good coach, you know when to ask questions and you actually know when to, with consent, give advice. When we make decisions according to our values, there is a rhyme and a reason and a rootedness into everything we do. We don't have to second guess ourselves, nor do we need to apologize. Welcome back to another episode of The Art of Online Business. I'm here with Dallas, as you can see. Before I introduce her, I want to explain something. This is part two. We just had part one seconds ago for us, maybe days or weeks ago for you, but that previous episode where we got to know each other and the segment's just called Before We Hit Record, and I'm happy to have her back, or I'm happy that she didn't run away after the first episode that we recorded <laughs> three minutes ago. Um, but Dallas is a pretty cool lady, worth your time to get to know her and get to know like kind of where she came from, what she stands for, and really cool tidbits about her husband, who she's been married to since 2003. <laughs> But um, as we get into this episode, again, if my voice is new to you, which is still weird to me, but maybe you don't listen to all the episodes. Hi, I'm Quajo, and um, I'm the new host of the Art of Online Business, and I got links for you below to where you can see where one, the former host, Rick, went to and what he's doing, and then also you can listen to another episode where he interviewed me. Speaking of interview, we yeah. got a person here, Dallas. Um, I have your bio right here, but basically if you're a coach and listening to Dallas, you'll want to get to know her better and head over to her podcast. She is the host of a podcast called Coaches on a Mission, and that's the podcast to listen to if you're a values-driven coach and you want the freedom and confidence and the impact that comes with a prosperous coaching business. And might I add purposeful coaching business? I feel like those two go together. But um, Dallas, you're also you're also the founder of The Hive, which is a one-stop membership program for coaches who want to turn this, I like how you wrote, turn this coaching thing into the life they love. So thank you for being back here again. Yeah, I'm happy to be back. Thank you. Yeah. No, this is really cool. You're welcome. It's uh, it's good good to be here. Good to record an episode with you. And so that question that I had asked before we hit record <laughs> was, you know, it seems like you have two specialties. One is you lean into your values and you teach online business owners how to really, I'm just going to say from what I've gathered, magnify their values and let those values guide their online businesses and how they approach them and how they relate to people. But then you also have these, let's just call them insanely workable and useful ROI tricks. <laughs> but, but, but you mentioned that it's the unscalable things that have the biggest impact and get you incredibly high ROI. Not to mention that when we were talking in the DMs when I first met you, you shared, what was that, a 21-day email nurture sequence? Yeah, I think right? so. Mm -hmm. And the, the ROI, the number, the ROI number that you had shared with me was just kind of mind blowing. I was like, huh? How is that even possible? So, so my first question is, is how are those two related, or how, how do you relate them together? Got it. So, how does like leading with your values in your business translate to unscalable marketing? Sure. Yeah, I think you said it um, much more eloquently. Than, than me, that's what I want to know. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, well, I think I'll start by just sharing my core values. And these are my values as a human, as well as a business owner. They're not different. Um, I really value belonging. I really value agency. Agency is that ownership of our choices, right? I want to have options and I want to be the person who's in charge of picking the options. And I love owning whatever results come from my choices. So belonging, agency, ambition. I used to say, uh, for people in my community who hear this, they're, uh, they might have some grieving to do. <laughs> but I used to say how one of my core values was spark, which I would describe as that moment when the way you see yourself changes because of that accomplishment that just happened. Like my daughter, when she taught herself to ride a bicycle, she was a different kid that day when she went to bed than she was when she woke up in the morning. But I realized that Spark 
okay, so my daughter, she changed how she saw herself. That wasn't by accident. That was a full day of working hard to accomplish something. So I've realized for me, Spark is all is a result of ambition. And I think over the last couple of years, I have uh, shied away from really claiming that ambition matters to me, but I'm going to claim it here right on your show. Um, and then integrity, right? So those are my core values. So if I look through the lens of my core values, in particular, belonging, I make marketing decisions that Carrie Perry would call them unscalable, right? These are person to person. I'm going to put in some effort to help you know that I see you and I hear you. Uh, and the result of that often is you enroll in my program or you recommend me to a friend or at the very least, you're going to trust me a lot. So for me, these unscalable, when I look at my values, I can sift through all of the possible launch strategies and pick the actions that most align with my values. And those for me happen to be unscalable because I value that person-to-person -person connection and that feeling of belonging. So unscalable marketing are things like, am I talking too much or can I keep going here? Is this uh, you can keep going. This part stayed in the podcast too. Keep going, please. So things like using Video Ask. So have you used Video Ask? Personally, no, but for like several ad clients, yeah, they have Video Ask on their sales page. Yeah. So Video Ask essentially is a platform where it features a video of me asking the viewer a question and they can respond either in written format, audio, or on video. So when people sign up for my webinar, they can video ask me, right? And I reply to every single person, which that is totally unscalable, right? But it's also why I have, we're in the middle of a launch right now and our webinars had a 57% attendance rate. And That's really good. That's it's really, really good, good, right? Standard is like it, 30. That's an aspirational <laughs> standard even. So, wow. Yeah. And it's because people know I see them right? So they, they feel this sense of belonging. And I'm going to show up if I know the webinar host is expecting me. So there's definitely strategic benefits to leaning into your values. But for me, we start with our values. That becomes the filter through which we choose our actions. For me, a big action is like, where can I make things unscalable? Uh, because that is more satisfying to me. And I've seen the ROI, especially for someone like me with a small list, right? I'm just really leaning into belonging to get the most mileage out of that, out of that list. And you know what's so interesting about video ask? I'll say, so people sign up for the webinar and I, you know, it's a video from me. What do you want to learn? I promise you, you will hear back from me. This last time, most people replied just in written format right? Then when I reply to them with a video, so they submit their question, just typing it in. Then I reply with a video. It was so interesting to see how many of them replied back with a video. So I was just seeing in real time in front of my eyeballs, that experience of belonging increasing dramatically for folks. It was a really fun experiment to, to witness. Yay. I just am really cluing in on the fact that you are good at connecting with people. I think I'm a great listener. My All of my years of coaching has made me a, an excellent listener. I don't think I'm good at connecting with people. I'm a Capricorn. We come off as cold. Oh, really? I did not get that. You just connected for a whole episode. I'm going to have to refute that. I don't, I don't, I didn't struggle to connect with you at all. And I definitely struggled to connect with folks, but okay. All right, Capricorn. Yeah, right? Bringing the Capricorn energy. But I do uh, care a lot about being heard and helping people know that they are heard. So I think it's my listening skills that help create that connection. Yeah. Coaching coaching is a practice. Does this make you like trained in life coach? In the school of life? What's that called? You know, for, The life coach. 
the yeah. life coach school. The life coach yeah. school. Yeah. Hey, we'll get right back to the episode in a moment. You want to make sure that you're avoiding all the mistakes with Facebook ads that could cost your business a good amount of money because your ads just aren't running like they should be. Well, you can hop on a call with me and I can look at your Facebook ads and you get to leverage my three years of Facebook ads management experience, optimize your account, fix it up right then and there on the call so that your ads will be running better and getting either more leads for you or making more sales for you. If you want my help, that is theartofonlinebusiness.com forward slash call. And we can hop on Zoom together and you will learn so much as I fix your ads for you. All right, now back to the episode. I got my certification in 2007 from IPEC which is the Institute for uh, Professional Empowerment Coaching. They've changed the acronym a few times over the years. I think that's the latest version. Um, but I've been coaching um, since then. So I've, I've put in a lot of hours coaching. And coaching is really just listening, right, and reflecting back what you hear and staying really curious. It's um, very intriguing. I only was exposed to coaching about three and a half. I guess when I first met... Rick Mulready, right? I'm the former host of this podcast. And before then, I never understood the difference between coaching and consulting. You weren't expecting this question, but how would you define those? Mm, yeah. Oh, and I have a controversial opinion about this. So I'll define them first and then I'll tell you what I think. Yeah. I got my hands on my hips already. Quaker, uh -huh, yeah, that? That. <laughs> <laughs> so coaching is mm, consulting is telling people what to do, right? I'm going to come in, I'm going to assess, I'm going to give you a roadmap or a blueprint to follow. Coaching, on the other hand, is mm, metaphorically sitting beside the client and asking deep, empowering questions to help the client uncover their best path forward. So that's like, if you talk to a coach, that, that's the distinction they're going to give. So now I'm going to get controversial. I think that coaching purists are making a mistake by never consulting. I think if you're really a good coach, you know when to ask questions and you actually know when to, with consent, give advice. Think about it. Let's just pretend that, that I'm a coach, like I'm a, I'm a sleep coach for, for new parents, right? Remember those days? <laughs> if only I got a four, a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. Yeah. Kind of. New parents are going to hire me because I am an expert at helping their child look, fall asleep on their own. What an injustice if, if all I ever do is ask them questions. Our clients hire us for our expertise. And if you're not, if you don't know when and how to offer those expertise in a client-centered way, you're not doing right by your clients. And you can like put, put that on my tombstone. That is something I will argue um, because there are a lot of coaches in the world who um, shy away from that. And they will tell you you're not coaching if you're ever giving advice. And that's just a disservice to folks. Well, I would agree. Like, I feel like with good coaching, you can, yes, reflect back. You can help somebody like figure out what is best for them. But like, ultimately, I believe like at that point where they figure out what direction like they want to go and they need to go and why, so to speak, it's like, you can also do them, like you said, the good service of showing them what that path like looks like further down the road. Yeah. And helping them own the path. That's, that's maybe another distinction between consulting. It's like, well, here's the path the consultant gave us and we and the client feels separate from but in coaching the client should really be invested in their path like imagine you're this facebook ads expert imagine if you never if you only ever coached your clients how well, maddening like, that would be <laughs> i don't think they want me to coach them they yeah, we, we wouldn't be here right we wouldn't right. be here talking <laughs> oh, that's great Oh, here's a lightning round type question that has nothing to do with a lightning round, but um, you talked about sleeping. So what's your hot take? Co-sleeping or no? Oh, completely. With my babe, yeah. She stopped sleeping with us. She's nine, probably at five years old. Yeah. And I, you know, I just like drank in every moment of that. Just kind of imagining the day when she's not going to be interested in sleeping next to me. 
she's still like she's an early riser i was an early riser as a kid too so i can't get mad but it's like 4 55 in the morning and she's awake so i will go and climb in bed with her and we'll just like have a morning chit chat together and it's just my favorite time of the whole day oh you're gonna make me cry stop now thinking of my daughter <laughs> i don't crawl in bed with her but like when you talked about that spark from learning especially how to ride a bike and then like I almost started tearing up there too because I remember like I can still remember when my daughter learned how to ride a bike and she was so happy but it also brings up so much emotion for me too because she uh do you know how much happened when we got stuck out of China no okay so we um and I'm coming back because I got some good questions for you regarding these unscalable high ROI activities and like I also since clearly from the last episode like you are so very grounded in and guided by your morals like I want to ask you like like what happens when you have to go through tough times because of I said morals values let's call those almost the same unless you have a hot take about how morals are not values um but I, I want to know like because those usually mean that you have to take a stand and sometimes they bring you into hard times because you want to stick with your values before we get there though uh, yeah, it made me tear up because we took a vacation from China where I had lived for 12 years and uh, to Mexico where I'm stuck now, but I like it here, um, right before the pandemic broke out. And so the reason thinking about my daughter learning how to ride a bike and when you talked about that spark where your daughter, when she learned to ride a bike, you could tell she just was not the same person. Like that brings up so much emotion for me because my daughter was three and change at the time. So she spoke fluent Mandarin um, because she grew up in China and she was going to like Chinese preschool and everything. And we had like a Chinese speaking <clears throat> nanny who was just Chinese. She, all she spoke was Mandarin. So when she was learning to ride a bike, those videos that I have, because like one of my values is communication in other languages, I guess maybe just communication with people who are different than you. And all the videos are in Mandarin because that was the language that me and her spoke because at the time it was like, we we're just going to go back to China because we were only here for a bit of vacation. And then because of the pandemic stuck outside of China, but still going back soon, at least we thought. Soon. And so like, I remember that and it made me kind of tear up inside because I missed those times. Yeah. Wow. Is she still speaking Mandarin? My son does. My daughter didn't uh, because she also struggled with stuttering. Um, not that growing up in a multilingual environment produces or um, enhances stuttering or enhances. That's not a good word. That's the wrong word. Um, makes stuttering worse. Like the doctor advised that since she stuttered so much, it could benefit her just to focus on two languages rather than acquiring three and a half year old, four year old, right? Acquiring more and more vocabulary in, in different languages because that already is a mental feat and let's call it, um, takes energy, right? And so we had to make what was for me a very hard decision to like no longer speak Mandarin with her. Yeah, it wasn't fun. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to cry if I keep talking about that. So, okay. um, but yeah, I miss those times. But yeah, it helped her. She still struggles with stuttering, but it ended up being the right decision for her. And uh, most of the time that we can speak Mandarin more, she's still interested in it, but she won't speak anymore. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. Before I start sobbing on the podcast and pouring out my soul, um, I do want to know that question. Like, what happens when you are sticking with your values? and it takes you to hard times or you have to make a hard decision. Like, how do you get through it? And like, what do you do? How do you process that? It's such a great question. So I think I've got, a, of course, I've got a little story, but I'll answer it more directly first. I think for a lot of people, when we make a decision, a question we ask ourselves, like, is this the right decision, right? We can second guess the choice. Hello, business owners. Yeah, right? But when you let your values lead, you don't have to second guess yourself. And I'm, it is not, it, the, making the decision is uh, clear, but it isn't easy. 
but at least there isn't, oh, is this the right choice? And we've got our pro and con list. Like there's none of that. We know what it is we want or need to do. And then it's just a matter of doing it. So I talk about this a lot inside the hive where like nothing is unfortunate, right? Nothing is unfortunate because uh, I'll be more clear. So let's just say you have a you have a program and people lose access after 90 days, right? Someone could ask for an extension on that and your answer being no isn't unfortunate for them. It's intentional. Right? When we make decisions according to our values, there is a rhyme and a reason and a rootedness into everything we do. And therefore, we don't have to second guess ourselves, nor do we need to apologize. Does it make things easy? Hell no, but it does make things clear. I'll give you an example. So the very first time I launched an online course, this was, this is old school. I've been doing this a long time. Zoom was not a thing. We used a tool called Maestro Conference, okay, where you could hit like star six to mute and unmute yourself. This is way back in the day. <laughs> so the first time I launched a scaled online program, I doubled my sales goal in less than 30 minutes. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect at all, right? Um, but it was, it, it went incredibly well, but here's the problem. I lied to get there. Uh Oh, what do you mean? I'm going to make numbers clear. So these aren't going to be accurate, but it's going to help me get the point across. So let's just say, uh, so I was working with a mentor at the time who suggested that, and I take ownership of this. This was my choice, not hers, but she advised me to tell people there were only 50 spots in the program, but really anyone could get in, right? So we're creating scarcity as a motivator. I didn't, I had no idea that so many people would want the program, but so there I am on Maestro con conference telling everybody you better act now because there are only 50 spots. Fast forward to the first Q&A call, we had a hundred people in that program and someone counted the number of people who were there and emailed me the next day to say like you said it was going to be 50 people and there were way more than 50 people what are you going to do about it and i was so it was interesting because this was a long time ago but my first reaction and luckily it only lasted a couple of seconds was to be mad at this person for calling me out <laughs> Right? Like, ugh, what, why is she counting? Doesn't she have better things to do? It's like, well, no, actually, liar, you need to own this. Well, one of my core values in, is integrity. Um, so I made it right, right? I owned up to it. I explained it to everyone. We divided the program in half. So I had two groups of 50, meant twice the work for me, all of the things, but it was the values aligned thing to do. And therefore, the decision was easy. It was painful to admit that I made a mistake. It, like all of none of that was easy, but it was clear and I'm better for it. Yeah. Wow. Just, I, I guess you're lucky she didn't call you out on the actual call. That would have been a little harder to deal with. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I can't even really remember. Oh, how do the values get you through the hard times? They, they're just like an anchor and I'm not, they're not going to make things easy, but they do make things real and I can, I can deal with reality. I'm very curious too, when you talk about having values, and I know you mentioned this in the previous episode, but you said that values give you staying power. Um, can you like speak to the, the online coach? I know you usually speak to coaches. Maybe that includes the online course creator. Just the person who's listening right now, who's going through like a challenging time in their business. Like how, how can they kind of lean in, maybe rediscover their values, but lean into those to get staying power to, to get through the hard times? Yeah. So your values, number one, your values in your business aren't different from your values in your life. So I think we think I got to have these special values for my business if I want my business to be successful. And like we're separate from those things. We're not authentic. It's not how it works, right? But you can have staying power when you live and lead by your values because you're not just like randomly making choices, right? We bring such a, a layer of intentionality 
to what it is we do, that everything we, even if the things we do don't work, we know how to course correct and adjust because it wasn't just some listening to a podcast, some lady talking about video ask, and now I'm going to go and add video ask to my launch, right? Without intentionality behind it. So she talked about video ask. How does that align with my values? How now do I want to implement it so that it is really values driven? So everything's just like a little, a little more rooted. And it's those roots that allow the tree to go, to grow and stick around. Okay. All right. I definitely don't want the listener to feel like, okay, we're talking about values, but I I want some tactics, (laughs) even though, yes, there's tons of strategy and tactics out there in the online business world. I feel like having the values does separate you, but separate um, you from everyone else. But I'm just really curious, and I know the listener is too, how are you getting like that 50%, 57%, I think you said before, like 60% show up rate to your to your webinars like what's do you want to share a little bit around that and like a couple of reasons how you do that yep absolutely okay so let's get super strategic there are three things that i do in what i call the show up sequence right so there's this ignored gap of time between the day someone registers for your webinar so i'm talking about a webinar launch here right and the webinar date Some of us, we're just so busy launching that we just don't even have the energy (laughs) to think about that gap of time. But if we can build a show up strategy to help the person maintain their excitement between the day they registered and the day of the webinar, more people will come. If more people come, you're going to sell more of your things, right? So there's three tangible things that I do. The first, we talked about it, it's video ask. Carve out time to have that personal connection with people. Number two, I created a quiz, right? So if you're going to if you're going to come to and I know you did an episode analyzing my quiz, so it's inspired by that, but it's a quick like six question quiz based on the content you're going to teach in the webinar. Okay, that's what I was about to clarify. It, it is a different quiz from the one that I reviewed in the other episode. Yep. Okay, cool. It's like All a little right. bit lighter, right? But it's designed to reveal which top, which point I'm going to make in the webinar is most applicable to you, right? So you take the quiz and I say, oh, it really sounds like the gap in your business is list building. We'll talk about list building about 20 minutes into the webinar. So please make sure you come. And here's your list building checklist of things to listen for during class. So now people, like, they need to come and they need to pay attention. That is, I have, so first of all, you hear so many things in the online course creator, let's call it coach launching space. I have never heard of a quiz and the results link into what you're going to talk in the webinar. That is, this is a first for me. And I've seen a lot, a lot of online business models, especially managing ads. Wow. So. Oh, that's really cool. And so if you think about it, if it's a free webinar, people don't, they have no skin in the game, right? But this quiz, now they've got skin in the game. There's a reason to come and it's personalized to them. Um, and then the last one is the reminder emails. I'm, whatever, like I'm using ad event so people, it's on their calendar. I'm not spending time in those reminder emails reminding people to come. I'm spending time in those reminder emails addressing their concerns so that they show up already planning on buying which is another incentive to come, right? Yeah, so that I, those are the three things, and they're unscalable in a lot of ways. They take more time. But, you know, the launch we're in right now, like I said, we're, we've dropped. We were at 62, right, in the last launch, but we're at, what, a 57% attendance. My live webinar is converting at 20%. So that's a huge difference in revenue if there are more butts in the seats at your actual launch event. Yeah. And let's not forget the context, like the current economic client, climate too. The fact that you are getting those high. There's so many people who attendance numbers are down, sales numbers are down, and like 
those kind of attendance numbers are are very very good so well and so let's loop it back to values a big part of that is uh, people in my world, they know what I stand for. I'm public about my values. And I'm not saying my values are better than anybody else's, but at least you know what what you're getting before you ever show up. So people like people sign up because they already know they want to be there, not just because they saw an ad or got an email, right? So there's like a, a deeper level of investment even before we're launching. And that loops back to knowing your values and communicating them.